When THX came out with their AAA amplifier technology, it promised high-end performance at a low price. The mass drop or now drop THX 789 amp was the first one commercially available. At only 400 US dollars, for the measured performance it seems like a crazy bargain, but does it make high-end amps redundant? To find out, I connected it to high-end sources such as the Shida Audio Yggdrasil and the Cord Hugo 2 and compared it with amps that are both under and over a thousand dollars. I used headphones such as those from Massdrop, like the uh, Sennheiser HD6XX behind me, as well as high-end headphones such as the Meze Empyreans and Focal Utopias. And I have to say the results were quite interesting. For your $400, you get quite a bit of amp. Starting with the power supply, the power supply uses a 24 volt brick which I've got sitting behind my desk so I won't show that at the moment. Unfortunately I don't have an alternate 24 volt power supply to test whether their claim that their negative feedback circuit eliminates all distortion really works, although the measurements say it does, but I'm going to take them at their word for that. The interesting thing is it uses a soft power on and off, so you press this button, it doesn't click or anything but activates a circuit which allows the power to flow through the amp and it will shut off automatically after about an hour. However, you can bypass that with this switch on the back so it will stay switched on the whole time. Also, if you yank your headphones in and out, I found it will automatically engage a protection circuit. A little red, the uh, light on the front, which is normally white, will switch to red for a second to stop you shorting the circuit and damaging either the circuit or your headphones. Now, onto the front is where you get the most features. It has a balanced headphone output. Now while the whole amp internally isn't fully balanced, this is not really a major issue, although some people think, seem to think it does. It doesn't matter in practical terms. But you do get two single-ended outputs that use half the uh, output circuit. So you have about three and a half watts of output via the balanced and uh, about half that roughly using the single-ended outputs. The useful thing though is that you have three gain levels. You have a low gain level which makes the amp very suitable for IEMs, uh, a mid gain level which is roughly what pe most people would use for normal headphone output and a high gain output if say you have a source with either very low output or you have headphones like hi fi Man's HE6s or the uh, Susvaras and uh, need all that full three and a half watts of power to go out to your headphones. And then of course it has your usual input switch which is annoyingly unlabeled so I always forget which I'm switching between the Yggdras or the Hugo 2 and then your volume pot. And the volume pot and other bits, well let's take a look inside and, and see what's actually in there. For my look inside the 789 I've propped the board up this time because the board is very shiny. Hello there and the light just reflects off it and whites everything out. Having a look, it does look very complex, but um, there are still some basic things going on here. You'll notice, of course, there are huge gaps. And I think, I'm guessing Massdrop has settled on one particular case size and design to make it easy to make a variety of components. And if they want to make a bigger and more complex component, they have space to do so. One thing to note though, is they could have put the power supply inside here. There's more than enough room for a transformer in the power supply, or basically the contents of the wall wart, even if it was just a switching power supply, as presumably the wall wart has. But they've decided to go for a wall wart, and I, I guess the whole amp relies on its uh, feed forward, kind of active negative uh, feedback circuit to minimize any you know, distortion caused by the power supply or any other design uh, simplifications. And it's kind of very apparent to me in the design. So starting with the power actually, it comes in here of course. Then we have a little power group in there for some kind of uh, rectification of the, uh, of the uh, DC input. I want to smooth it out. Normally there are capacitors uh, also included that to kind of smooth out the power supply. But I guess they found that maybe they found they made no difference with the feed forward circuit. Uh, normally you do have some kind of capacitance on the power supply to supply, can ensure that the power supply to the circuit is consistent so that even when you have a sudden peak in the music when a lot more power is flowing through, the power supply isn't suddenly drained of power and can't keep up. And that can cause flatness in the sound. And But they've decided of course that's not necessary and I guess these capacitors affect that in, will do have some of that effect in, in, in the design. So we see the power coming through these traces through to the uh, amplification circuit. And we have a switch here which is whether you want the auto power off and that is probably connected by uh, traces maybe on the other side or in the board which through to the this little circuit up here. This is where you have your switch to engage the power. Now we have a soft power circuit here. 
and it has a little chip in there which detects if audio is playing. I guess there's some connection through from the audio circuit. And when audio stops playing, maybe there's some kind of timer built in, maybe to one of these chips, which after a certain period of time, depending on the, the setup, it will automatically power off. Now, then we have the uh, analog parts, and it does get a little bit complex, as this is, it's a balanced amp, but apparently the circuit internally is mostly, sing is, is mostly or partly single-ended. Now, one shouldn't get you know, a fuss over this. It's just something that's, it's just one of the many kinds of designs you can have, and it doesn't really matter much in the end whether the internal parts are balanced or single-ended. It's the, the rest of the design that's kind of more critical. So we have balanced and single-ended inputs, and we see these uh, cream, five cream-colored things, which are relays, and we actually have a gap for a space for one more as part of the circuit, but I guess was unnecessary for one reason or another. And these obviously are used to switch between balanced and single-ended, so when this is engaged, or disengage depending on which in uh, I always forget which is <laughs> single ended, which is the balance setting because it's not written. These will be switched out now. Of course, balanced uses doesn't means these positive and negative singles don't come into contact with the ground, whereas the uh, single ended circuit it does. So you need that switched out when you're switching between balanced and single ended because you don't want ground crossing in there where it shouldn't. Otherwise, things will go wrong. So normally with a, the input to an amp, we'll say if it was just a single-ended amp or just a balanced amp, it would come into the volume pot directly usually, and then the volume pot would supply a certain amount of the signal to the amplification signal for, uh, and that's where the gain would be controlled for the most part. The thing is here, this volume pot is only single-ended. It only has three contacts on the bottom. The, there's a double version, which is doubly as thick and as six contacts and two controllers in there which would make it balanced. Now since we have a balanced input, now this can't see the signal, the traces on the board here and they're not underneath, it appears to be a multi-level board and these little dots along here seem to be where the traces for the, the uh, signal come in. These, um, it's obviously the signal if it's balanced is converted to single-ended first before being fed to the volume pot. So that means there's a small chance that you could overload the, uh, actually overload the balanced input, say if you had a, a, a source that used uh, uh, and you had an excessively high signal, which I don't think there is anything in terms of balance that there isn't single-ended if you use some chord products. And if you did use a single, if you did use like an RCA to XLR converter, it is possible that you could overload the conversion circuit here. So it's something to be slightly, slightly note, and it has happened with some amps like Audio GD, which uh, they have the volume controls after a gain stage. You can actually load the input, overload the input, whereas a normal amp where the input goes straight to the volume pot, you can't do that. So that being said, so we have some kind of conversion to single-ended and apparently, uh, and we have an amplification circuit or circuits in here. I'm not entirely sure how this is set up. Normally you have like a buffer and an output and a, an op amps or something like that and a standard two-stage amplification stage. The output here is using Texas Instruments OPA 564s, which are rated at one and a half watts each. And I guess in balance, they've managed to get them to go to three and a half watts combined and managed to keep the linearity, which is pretty impressive. And I guess all stuff tends to have specs which are slightly below what they're capable of for obvious reasons, and they've done that here. There's also the gain stages connected in directly here. And there's, I guess these could be the gain re resistors connected to gain. And of course, this appears to be, uh, could well be single-ended as well, which probably says much about what's going on. Then we have this output, of course, goes to balanced or single-ended. But that's kind of how the uh, THX seems to work. And of course, one part of this will be the, the feed forward circuit. I'm not quite sure which is the, feed, the, uh, the, the negative feedback circuit. It could be this one, or it could be part of this built in here. Uh, apologies that I don't know in detail. I'm not an electrical engineer, but it's interesting to look at inside how these things work and be interesting to see what happens if you did connect a couple of capacitors up there. It might help a little bit with the uh, sensor dynamics that you get compared to more expensive amps. Speaking of that, the dynamics were kind of what I noticed the main difference between the uh, 789 and, and other amps. But to start with, you know, the sound as as such, it's it's built to be very low distortion, and that kind of perception came through very clearly. It had a very uh, signature of just getting straight out of the way of the music. The, the music came through, and the signature of say the uh, the DAC I was using came through very cleanly. It has what I call a, a low distortion smoothness. That is, uh, some people consider smoothness as uh, meaning like rolled off in the treble or something like that. Nothing like that, but a complete lack of any harshness or anything unpleasant in the sound. Although I've seen some people say that they thought there was something funky about the mid-range. I didn't experience that with the 789. 
it would be something to check out all the same. I would have liked to have used it with a you know a better power supply again to see if it made any difference, but I didn't have a chance to do that, and I could only go on you know what I have set up here. But one thing I did notice that it does the sound quality is very very good, and it was such that I could clearly make out the difference between the sources that I used, whether I used the little Modi multi bit or the Bifrost, which I reviewed recently, or went up to the Yggdrasil. I could clearly make out which uh, you know deck I was using and the kind of different characteristics of that deck uh, when I was listening. Now I tried also direct out of the Hugo 2, which is about the best sound quality you can get in something, you know, it's $2,500 versus uh, out of the Hugo 2 connected through the 789. Now you think there'd be absolutely no difference, but with the best recordings I had level matched, I did notice a tiny bit of detail loss going through the 789. And again, there's something to consider that the measurements taken of these devices do use signals that do not relate directly to music. They are just uh, test signals. So when it comes to like the, and this is where I think maybe it comes down to my impressions versus much more expensive amps. So I compared it to Audio GD's Master 9. I compared it to the Holo Audio Azure, which I've reviewed. Now those amps are, you know, something like three to four times the price. I mean, the Holo Spring Azure is $1,600, so four times the price. And the difference in sound quality was only a little bit in my experience. So it wasn't a huge jump up, certainly nowhere near four times the jump up. And it just spoke of the, uh, the great value that the 789 is, that there was only a little bit of an increase in sound quality. And I'm sure someone's going to ask me, is it worth jumping up from a 789 to something like a Master 9? or a uh, Holler Azure or some other amp along those range. And probably my answer would be, if the jump is pocket change for you and it's not going to affect your budget much, maybe it would be. But if it is a big deal, probably not. And I think in that sense, a lot of people might be will be considering, you know, they're, they're, a lot of drop shoppers consider that uh, they will use it with an inexpensive deck. And it will reveal the quality or lack thereof of that inexpensive deck. So. In that, you know, it definitely wouldn't be uh, uh, they, those kind of people. If you're one of those kind of people, you wouldn't be considering the jump up and you want to consider the best value. Well, then definitely this is uh, one of the best value amps I've ever experienced. And it's really pushed the uh, something called the law of diminishing returns up a great deal. And the, that kind of law of diminishing returns states that the the more you to get an increase in, you know, early on in low amounts of money, the increase in sound quality goes up at about the same rate as the price does. But after a certain point, it kind of drops off. And for every maybe extra thousand dollars, you're only getting like a 5% difference in sound quality. That's starting to really hit now at the four to $500 mark. After that, you're starting to spend a lot more money to get only a little bit of an increase in sound quality. The other factor, of course, is music. A lot of music out there that especially even I listen to, which sounds great you know, if I'm listening to my car stereo, doesn't sound so great when you hear the, the lack of recording quality or lack of mastering quality through a high-end system. So those are those factors to consider as well. Um, one of the things uh, is that, uh, you know, being that difference being so small, I did also, and this is going to annoy some people to say this, but I did try comparing going from the Yggdrasil through to the 789 using cheap cables and then using expensive cables, and I did notice a significant difference, at least for me. So it, it speaks mostly, and I say this not to do, talk about cables, but to talk about the, the sound quality that is available out of this 789. It did a fantastic job. I think the main difference between the sound quality of this, apart from, and the, say, a Master 9 or the Holo Spring Azure, was not so much that, you know, there's maybe a tiny bit of an increase in uh, a detailed retrieval but the main thing was kind of the sense of dynamics uh, the dynamics being of course the the how like if you say if someone hits a drum if you actually have been up close to a drum being hit it's actually the dynamics are really powerful it really does smack you uh, and you don't get that uh, you especially don't get that with headphones I've only heard one pair of headphones that can reproduce that accurately actually and that was the three and a half thousand dollar RAL ribbon headphones but the sense of dynamics was greater out of the better amps, such as the Master Knight and the Hollow Spring Azure. And the sense of space was better out of the Hollow Spring Azure. It has a, 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 gives a very good sense of space, uh, whereas the Audio GD aims for kind of a slightly flatter and, and, and textbook neutral kind of presentation. And also there's uh, been uh, adding to that a bit of extra detail out of the Hollow Spring Azure made it the better amp. But again, four times the price. And I've seen also some people, they'll, maybe they, they want to save money, and also because they might have spent a lot of money on something like an Yggdrasil, like the one I have behind me, and they don't want to, they, maybe they're saving up for a Ragnarok, or saving up for something like a Master 9, or a HE9, and 
they don't want to spend a huge amount of money. They want something to tie them over or something that will be good enough until they can get the dream system that they want. And they might consider the 789, and for that, that will fill in very, very nicely. So it was, uh, compared to other amps in its price range, I've just had the Asgard 3 here. The Asgard 3 is, again, it's $200, half the price, but you can also get it for $400 with a DAC. It was a little bit behind the 789. The 789 was noticeably clearer. The Asgard and the cheaper shit amps, like the, uh, I've got a Magni sitting up there, kind of have a very, f the, like the soundstage is wide, but the sound, the depth is very flat. And, but in terms of, you know, drive, it do does drive headphones very well. The 789 drives headphones quite I incredibly well. Uh, you have that, again, that huge variety of, of choice. You have low gain, which will drive, you know, ev even sensitive IMs very, very well. Medium, all headphones I tried were excellent. Your usual drop options such as the 6XX and uh, 7XX. And on high gain, it would power through even Susvara's actually quite decently. It's not going to quite do what a speaker amp does, but when I did need really high gain, it did a very admirable job and stayed very clean and clear while listening. So if you're considering it as something better than, say, a $200 or, or the, you know, $99 or $200 or thereabouts amp, it definitely does the job. And if you're considering, like, you don't want to spend, you don't want to even consider spending, you know, say, you know, over $1,000 on an amp, it will probably do, it will probably give a run for the money of anything up to $1,000 and, and maybe a bit over, depending how things go. But at the same time, the penalty of that is I would avoid using any really cheap balanced DACs. And it's a bit of a diversion. I do want to talk about that. Uh, a lot of cheap, you know, from especially from China, a lot of cheap balanced decks come out, and people think, "Oh, balanced is so important." Absolutely not. If you consider these things are made down to a price. If you have to keep a price of a product down to a certain level, uh, if you if you consider that balanced circuitry out of a deck isn't going to give a vastly big increase in sound quality. It is just not going to happen. What happens is, it's actually more likely to be the opposite. As to keep the price down to that level, to provide a balanced circuit, you have to provide not one amplification circuit, but double it to make it balanced. That means you may double the components, double the cost for the amplification circuit, and what's going to be sacrificed? Probably the power supply. And if the power supply is sacrificed, it's more likely to have a lower sound quality. Now, the best deck I have here is single-ended. And this is why it's also important that the fact that this is in single-ended internally makes no difference whatsoever it will not there's balance is not some magical thing that that makes things all the more better i mean they could perfectly single ended out was perfectly good with anything within its the required power range one and a half watts of single ended output is going to be way above any volume level you're likely to listen at unless you have again something like the uh, hi-fi man's he6 or sasvara's for most amps, you probably won't even use anywhere near half a watt of power. So it actually will be quite sufficient as it is. And again, the best amp I have here is single-ended. So I advise strongly if you do consider, and this is something people do ask me, what DAC should I buy with something like a 789? I will buy the best single-ended DAC you can afford. Or if you can afford something like a Bifrost 2, or maybe even, even an Yggdrasil, if you can afford an Yggdrasil, I would get you consider getting that. If it doesn't become a major financial burden, I never recommend overspending on uh, stuff. Food and clothes are more important. So an overall value, Dropper provided a excellent amp overall. It really, feature-wise as well, it's not just the, the, the magic circuit, but the whole setup could make this an endgame amp, an inexpensive endgame amp for many people who don't want to go spend dig deep into their pockets to get an excellent hi-fi system and it worked really well with everything i plugged into it even up to super very very expensive utopias and i've got ether 2s here as well in for review and even when i wanted to plug in iems it did fantastically so that is the drop thx aaa 789 and if you do have any questions comments good or bad or actually constructive criticism is welcome as well let me know below thumbs up and, and do subscribe if you want to see more of my reviews of various products. I have some other things floating around here such as these my spheres and uh, the cost system from Drop as well in for review. Also don't forget that these videos are supported primarily by my viewers. So if you consider uh, giving me a thank you by supporting me, you can buy stuff through Amazon links on my videos. You can actually become a supporter for a month or two and it's like buying me a cup of coffee. And in return, I'll give you, if you have any questions or need some advice on purchasing stuff, I'll happily help you out. And I'll also let you see the videos and my impressions of new gear before everyone else. To do that, check out the link in the, the link that you can see on screen or in the description. And thanks once again for watching, and I'll see you online.